Thank you, Francis. Well, I'm taking us uh, back a little bit to the 13th century, and I want to look at Ireland in what I'm calling the, the first English empire. This is following uh, the work of Rhys Davies and John Gillingham and others. Uh, so it's very definitely using the word empire, and the question is, what sort of empire in this period? And it's very definitely using the word English for the 12th century and the 13th century, uh, and the idea of an English, an attempt to create an English imperial polity during the 12th and the 13th century. Oh. Did you see the space file might, might come back? There we go. Oh. Um, even amongst English people who spoke French and originally came from France. So what we're looking at here is an attempt to create an English political identity and an English political dominance uh, across Scotland, Wales and Ireland during the 12th and 13th centuries. Now when we look at this we can see I think a number of phases and we can see the development of an English empire in the high middle ages in stages, in different forms of empire. The first form I think comes in the 12th century and we can actually see it from the very end of the 11th century following the Norman conquest in England. And what we have there is an attempt to extend political authority, not creating uh, incorporated territories, but simply extending political authority. Rhys Davies refers to it as a type of high kingship. So what you have is an assertion by the kings of England of their dominance over Wales, over Scotland, and over Ireland. And we can pick this up in the Irish Annals, for example, increasingly take interest in the doings of the English kings, particularly when they assault Welsh kings and Scottish kings. We can see this in the famous bull, Law the Billiter, where the, the papacy gave Ireland to the King of England. Uh, very big controversies around Law the Billiter. And this is part of another process of extending a, an assertion of English control over Ireland. We can see it in 1169 when Dermot McMurrah, when he looked for outside assistance, he automatically went to Henry II. The great power to appeal to was the King of England. And we can see that process happening from the 1090s onwards, even in Ireland, much more strongly in England than Wales, or in Scotland than Wales, but even in Ireland. Secondly, then, we have a second stage, which is aristocratic and peasant colonisation. And we get that from 1169 onwards. Uh, the, the movement of aristocrats holding lordships and peasants holding farms within manors. And alongside that then, a, an extension of governmental and legal incorporation of Ireland within a wider English pot. But this is weak, it is episodic, it's geographically uh, disparate, and uh, it's not very successful. And we have the establishment of a type of imperial control with weak central government. Crucial to this phase is a failure to incorporate the Gaelic Irish within the colony itself, and secondly, a weak, a weak arrangement with the Gaelic Irish who remained outside the colony. Uh, I, I'm using the word protectorate there because it's a word used by uh, D.W. Meinick when he talks about his model of empire. It's not a word we'd be familiar with in this uh, particular context. But what I want to look at uh, today uh, is a particular episode within the development of an English empire in Ireland. So we can, let's look at those two stages, extension of political authority, secondly peasant and aristocratic colonisation with a weak governmental overlay. And then I, what I want to look at is an episode at the end of the 13th century which shows us the next stage in the development of an imperial policy uh, in Ireland, which is the attempt to extend bureaucratic and governmental control in Ireland, uh, to actually have really effective English imperial government in Ireland. And I think this represents a major shift in the relationship between England and Ireland and in their attempt to develop an imperial structure. Now, what's also important about this episode at the end of the 13th century is that the 14th century was a period of great difficulty and the, the momentum that was building up in the 13th century was never followed through. So it's hard for us to say uh, exactly where this type of development was going. 
So what I want to look at is the, the reign of Edward I, uh, 1272 to 1307, and this attempt to incorporate, during his reign, to incorporate Gascony, Ireland, Scotland and Wales into an English polity or political and administrative space. What we have is Edward engaged in war, diplomatic and political campaigns, incurring huge expense and leading to taxation. This taxation in England never been sufficient to cover his needs. So what we start getting is the extension of English uh, parliamentary taxation to Ireland. And we have the attempt to implement what's called a lay subsidy in Ireland. And a lay subsidy is a tax on movable wealth. Movable wealth, which is anything that's not land. And essentially it is uh, grain uh, and some other products and some other particularly important uh, aspects such as in, in the towns, uh, beds and jewels and things such as that. Lay subsidy was a key part of what David Carpenter has called Edward I's tax-based parliamentary state. And Edward I in England was trying to generate a process of regular taxation, of periodic regular taxation. Couldn't do it, he still had to go to a parliament every time, but he was doing it much more often and trying to base his state on that source of income. In 1290, Edward I was granted a 15th, that's a 15th of everybody's movable wealth, um, in England, in return for which he agreed to expel the Jews from England. And the, the quid pro quo for the aristocracy and the urban, uh, the bourgeoisie, to give him this taxation was that he kicked the Jews out of Ireland, or out of England, and they all owed money to the Jews. So this was very uh, acceptable. And then in 1291-92, Edward still didn't have enough money to pay his debts and to continue his campaigns, and we have an attempt to extend this taxation to Ireland. And we have a detailed account of Edward's attempts to negotiate this taxation. We know first of all that he approached the, uh, the great lords in Ireland, and then secondly, he called a meeting, a sort of a quasi-parliament in Dublin, where the barons, the magnates, and the, uh, the faithful community of Ireland called and came. Everybody agreed to paying the tax on certain conditions. However, the Irish, and this meant the Irish, the English in Ireland at this point, they were complaining that uh, they would have great difficulty in paying this tax because uh, they were all in debt due to daily wars, or to an almost permanent condition of warfare. The Irish then, and it's interesting here, calling them the Hibernia Incolae, the inhabitants of Ireland, and he's effectively referring there to the descendants of the settlers who came over in the late 12th and the early 13th century. These are the English in Ireland, not the, not the Gaelic Irish, because the Irish claimed to be poor, and if a hasty collection tax made them poorer, that the Irish, the enemy Irish, the unfaithful Irish, the inimici infideles Hibernici, who were the, the Gaelic Irish, that they would rise up and crush them down. What's interesting about this is that in attempting to establish a bureaucratic state in Ireland through the process of raising taxation, is the Crown in this period had to do it through agreement. They had to negotiate. They had to negotiate with the towns, they had to negotiate with the uh, aristocracy. The Irish demanded that all sorts of things be excluded from the taxation arms, horse gear and so on, they insisted that debts that were owed to them be excluded from the taxation, that they only pay it in installments, that it be put off for a period to give them a chance to gather the, the money to pay this tax, and all of this was granted by the Crown. So the central state in the form of the Crown was relatively weak in this period, even at a period where uh, it was at probably at its height in terms of strength. In order to carry out this tax then, they had to assess people's movable wealth. And what we know about the process from documentary records is that assessors, sub-assessors were commissioned. Assessments were carried out on an individual basis. So this is really extraordinary for the Middle Ages. 
We would not get this again until the 17th century, where households were valued on an individual basis. Everyone was included, except for the very poor and the clergy. What's important about it, I think, as well, is that the movable wealth was surplus wealth. Grain that was to be used as seed grain, grain that was to be used to pay tithes, grain for subsistence was all excluded. So when you look at the assessment of wealth in this taxation, you're looking at wealth that are goods that were available to be sold on the market. So it's almost an index of market penetration. Collectors were appointed. And what's interesting about these collectors, we can find out quite a bit about the people who were collected. What it indicates is that there were a class of people who were already engaged in government uh, offices, such as John the Blunt, a collector for Limerick. He had been a collector of the new custom. He answered for the farm of Limerick, the royal farm of, of the city of Limerick. John the Pember up there at the end had been a collector of the new custom in Yaw, a purchaser of supplies for Edward's wars in Scotland. There was a class of individuals in Ireland who were royal bureaucratic officials, and they made it possible to begin this process of establishing a bureaucratic state. The taxation, we would originally have had a whole series of records of this taxation, local assessment roles, county assessment roles, receipt roles of the exchequer, and so on. Uh, we know from Wales what the individual assessment roles would have looked like, where we get every household and a valuation for that household, and then in this case they would have paid a fifteenth of that valuation for their lay subsidy. These did exist for Ireland. None of them survive anymore. All we have left are the treasurer's receipt rolls, which are done on a county by county basis. But we know from other references that those other levels of record keeping existed. And the existence of those records, to my mind, is one of the strongest indicators of the fact that the state was able to do that at all, is an indicator that there was this moment where uh, a functioning imperial state was established in Ireland in the 13th century. And we have, uh, we have these records, I'm going through the manuscripts at the moment, uh, in London, uh, but we have them published as well, and so far my, my sort of concordance of the published version and the manuscripts is indicating that the published version is pretty correct. Uh, there, there aren't too many serious errors uh, between what Sweetman published in the 1880s and uh, the original manuscripts. So we, we find out county by county how this tax was being collected. And we can, we can look at this then, exchequer term by exchequer term, uh, from the time they started collecting the tax, and by county, and in some cases by subdivisions of the county. You can see in Dublin uh, we have city, Fingal and valley. It's like South Dublin, Fingal, and, um, and the city of Dublin that we have at present. It's a similar division uh, to what we have at present. And we come up with a, a headline figure uh, of the total collected in the, this 1292 uh, lay subsidy of just over to nearly 10,500 pounds, which was a very large sum of money. For all of England, from the 1290 taxation, they collected 100,000. So, uh, this Ireland, I think, was overpaying. And I think the reason was that the Irish were unfamiliar with this form of taxation. And they, they fessed up to what, they, what their valuation was, whereas the English had become particularly expert at uh, evading the valuation process. Having said that as well, I think what it probably also indicates, though, is that Ireland at the end of the 13th century was very prosperous. And the reason why Edward I wanted to extend an English form of taxation to Ireland was that there was wealth being generated in Ireland, and surplus wealth being generated, which could be taxed. We can track this money coming in. Uh, here we have all the years in the exchequer terms, four exchequer terms in each year. We track the money coming in, comes in in a rush, and then slows off, and they're still collecting it in 1299. In fact, they're still collecting it in, the, in up to 1310 and even beyond, tiny amounts even beyond that. They got every penny of their valuation as far as we can make out. This, they, had, they still have, at this point, have the ability to collect these sorts of things. We can, uh, we can compare different counties. We can compare different counties. Here we have uh, Dublin and Wexford. And we can see there's quite a difference between the, the, the pattern, the chronological pattern of collection between Dublin and Wexford. Something strange was going on in Wexford. 
I think there was some sort of corruption, there was some sort of difficulties in the, uh, the collection of the tax in Wexford. We can then look at uh, what was collected, and we can see here we have the receipts per county in, in pounds, and uh, we can see that Cork comes up the top, we go down to Mead, Dublin, Kilkenny, and so on. Uh, but, geographical point of view, what's also important here is that we can uh, look at where they managed to get money from. So here we're talking about this third stage in the creation of an English imperial state in Ireland in the Middle Ages. And what we can see very clearly here is from the collection of the lay subsidy of, of 1292 is that this English imperial state in Ireland had a very, a very definite uh, regional existence. So that basically beyond the Shannon and up into Ulster, the English imperial state didn't exist. They were not able to collect revenue uh, from the West. And even within that, we'll see in a minute, there were variations in what they could do even within the area where they were able to collect money. So it's probably more valid to try and look at the receipts in terms of area. So the previous uh, histogram was just money received. This is money received per thousand square kilometers within those counties. And you can see this shows quite a different picture. And we have a very definite pattern here where we have Dublin and Uriel, which is basically loud, standing out well above all the rest of them. We go down to another group in Mead, Kilkenny and Carlow, and down to another group in Kildare, Wexford and Limerick, Waterford and Tipperary and Cork, and then down to areas where we get very small amounts per thousand square kilometres, such as Ulster, Loch Sheedy, which is essentially West Mead, and Kerry, where we get hardly anything at all. I haven't put County Clare in because they got two pounds from one rally, and that's all they got from, from uh, essentially all they got from West of the Shelf. And when we look at this, uh, we see a very clear geographical pattern uh, in terms of the, uh, the distribution of wealth in 13th century Ireland and also the strength of the English colony and the English state in 13th century Ireland. Because we have a mixture here of ability to collect and wealth. I think we're looking at both things happening at the same time. And essentially what we're looking at, uh, when we look at that distribution of wealth, is the existence of the pale in the 13th century. Not as a late medieval phenomenon, but as an economic region in the 13th century. And it was probably an economic region going right back through the 13th century. And uh, also the existence of what Adrian Empey has called the second pale in South Tipperary, Kilkenny, uh, parts of Wexford and Carlow, uh, that that also existed in the 13th century. Not just a late medieval phenomenon. That, that that regional pattern was well established at the height of the English colony, the height of its prosperity. We can also see, I think, Meinig's uh, imperial model works really quite well for 13th century Ireland. Meinig was obviously writing about early modern uh, America, but his idea of a capital, and Dublin stands out head and shoulders above the other places, a, a core region, so we've got basically Dublin, and loud or that pale region as a core, and then a domain beyond that in, in this second pale, and then these protectorates, as he calls them, which are the, the regions which are beyond direct imperial control, but are still within the overall umbrella or ambit of the empire. And essentially what the receipt rolls of the 1292 Lake subsidy are showing us is, first of all, the Areas of Ireland that were most penetrated by uh, what historians and economic historians are called the commercialising economy of the 12th and 13th century in England and a wider English realm. But secondly, I think what the, uh, the lay subsidy returns show us is that in the 1290s, that the English state had the ability to assess, in the areas where they had control, to assess every individual household and go out and collect revenue based on that assessment for every individual household and generate a very large sum in relative terms from that taxation. What's also important is that this was an episode. I think it was an episode confined to probably the period from about 1250 to 1300. And if it had been unchecked, I think we could have seen the development of something much more like an early modern or modern state in the Middle Ages. 
The problem, of course, was that the 14th century was a period of enormous difficulty. So in Ireland, uh, we get, in the 14th century, we get the, uh, the Bruce invasion, we get the famine of 1315 to 1317, uh, we get uh, the decline of agriculture through the overuse of the land. We have a whole series of calamities coming together in the early 14th century, and then, of course, 1348-49, we have the Black Death, and for the English colony, that was devastating. So the first half of the 14th century was just one mitigated disaster. I also think the English colony in Ireland was weak because it was fundamentally fractured by a failure to incorporate the Gaelic Irish into that empire. A fundamental failure to incorporate the Gaelic Irish, both within the empire and in the mining style protectorates. So that this moment or episode of the development of a bureaucratic governmental empire that that never continued, and the episode came to a rather abrupt end with the, the calamities of the early 40s.